Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. I am the agent for truth, Joe Bannister, your host. Happy Saturday morning to you. Agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com are the websites. Freedom Above Fortune radio show is coming to you courtesy of Liberty Works Radio Network and also broadcasting to the Tampa, Ocala, Florida area courtesy of 104.3 FM. We hope you'll tell your friends to listen to Liberty Works Radio Network and support it. You can go to the lwrn.net website and click on the Join Donate button to help out. You will find that Liberty Works Radio Network brings you radio programming you will not hear anywhere else. Given the many blessings that God has bestowed upon our country, I dedicate every show to our Father in Heaven. So I always start the show by praying as Jesus instructed us in Matthew chapter 6. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Well, our country is certainly in deep trouble, as I'm sure most of my listeners are well aware. And I urge everyone to fervently pray for God's blessings on our country. Let's redouble our efforts to obey his commandments, especially refraining from taking the Lord's name in vain. Remember that Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I invite you to join my email list by visiting my website at freedomabovefortune.com or there are links at agentfortruth.com. You'll see a mailing list choice on the left-hand side of the home page. For those that are new to the show, I'm a former special agent with the Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigation Division. I no longer work for the IRS because during the last two years of my service there, I performed an off-duty investigation into claims that the income tax laws did not actually require most Americans to file federal income tax returns and pay federal income tax, and that the IRS was actually deceiving the American public about their true income tax obligations. After gathering and analyzing a great deal of evidence, I concluded that these claims were largely true, and when I asked my IRS supervisors to discuss my conclusions with me, they not only refused to have any discussions with me, but they also encouraged me to resign from the agency. My IRS career came to an end rather abruptly in 1999 when I did resign from the Internal Revenue Service, and I've been speaking about my experiences and conclusions regarding the federal income tax and other liberty-related matters ever since. Our guest for this Saturday is Sherry Peel Jackson. She was uh, at one point an IRS revenue agent, and uh, she's well-known by quite quite a bit of the American public. But she's uh, been through a lot. She's really sacrificed a great deal uh, for her fellow Americans, for all of us. So, Sherry, I, I'm very uh, happy to welcome you to the Freedom of the Fortune radio show. Joe, thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to uh, to have you, to hear your voice. And uh, I think, you know, best, uh, we've got about 10 minutes to hear and just like to get started with kind of, you know, for the listeners who maybe don't know your story, um, you know, it's all right to go back a little bit, maybe not quite to, uh, you know, first the birthday and <laughs> the cake and all, but, you know, go, go in a little detail about, uh, where you come from, how you were raised, uh, that kind of thing. And then we'll just kind of dovetail into, you know, your adult life, your professional life, and then and move from there. Okay. Well, I was born in Detroit in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> That's how far I go back. But, you know, I grew up in a, a family that was very, very uh, lower middle class. Um, my father was very pragmatic very serious, and um, both my, both my parents taught me to question everything, question authority, even ask them questions. Don't be afraid to ask adults questions about what they're doing, their decisions and whatnot. So all through school, I think I was a little curious kid, and even in high school I caused a big stir a lot of times because I was asking the principal and the uh, teachers why they were doing things. Graduated from college in 1984 and uh, I already knew that I wanted to be a CPA because I was pretty good in math and I figured I liked nice things and I wanted to have a job that would bring in um, enough money for me to get the things that I liked. After college, I worked at a couple of CPA firms and then uh, I was in corporate America for about a year. That was just too 
cutthroat for me. So I, I saw an ad in the paper uh, for an internal revenue agent, and I said, okay, well, I might do something like that. I knew how to do taxes, as a matter of fact. That was the only class that I got an A in in accounting in college. So I applied. I got the job. Uh, I was hired actually on the spot, and then I started working there in January of 1988. Worked there seven and a half years faithfully as a revenue agent and, you know, really excelled at the job, got plenty of promotions and uh, awards and whatnot. I decided after being there seven and a half years that it was time for me to come home because as you progress, you probably know this, you get more responsibilities, and there were more responsibilities taken away from my family life. I had two small children by that time, and uh, my time at the IRS was taking a toll on my family life because I was staying out late sometimes trying to get jobs done. One time I even had to get wired up for a bribe. I couldn't even tell my husband where I was going. So after about 18 months of going back and forth, I finally decided to quit. I quit the job in 95, stayed home and did really nothing for about a year, but Betty Crocker and uh, was not for me. So I opened a CPA firm, and along about 99, people started coming to me, and they were asking me questions about the Internal Revenue Service and about the income tax. They had started hearing from other sources that, yeah, you know, most Americans that live and work in the 50 states aren't liable for the income tax. Now, I really was really busy with my CPA firm, and I thought about, hmm, at some point I'll do some research because I didn't hear about anything like this when I was at the IRS. Well, finally, in 2000, the questions came from ministers. When I was at the IRS, I was uh, auditing ministers. I was actually in charge of something called a preacher project where I would audit the ministers since the IRS couldn't get into the churches. And I did that for two and a half years. And when I left the IRS, one of the things I did with my little CPA firm was inform ministers about their accounting and how they were um, governing themselves because the IRS was after them. They have market segment specialization programs. It's called MSSP. They have them for different businesses, but they also have them for ministers. And uh, they were under the assumption that a lot of ministers don't pay taxes, they get a lot of money under the table or in a little brown bag, and they wanted to get these ministers so that they could get promotions. Because when I was at the IRS, the agents that got a politician or a minister got promotion. So I started talking to the ministers, and they were saying I needed to research this, and I finally um, got one of the ministers sent her parishioner to me with a lot of information about the income tax. And this woman actually was the daughter-in-law of uh, one of the civil rights movement um, participants, Hosea Williams. It was his daughter-in-law, and she gave me the information. I looked over her information, and then she told me about a group called We the People Foundation for Constitutional Education and the fact that they had uh, a We the People ad in the USA Today, and this was about July 2000. I found the ad, I read it, and uh, there was a challenge in there for $50,000 for anybody that could prove that most people that live and work in the 50 states are liable for the income tax. And at that time, $50,000, that was a lot of money to me. So I put aside what I was doing at the time and started researching, researching the codes, the regulations, looking at the information that the people were giving me, sizing it up with what was on the uh, IRS website. And after about two weeks, I came to the conclusion that there was a problem. I could not easily find this law. I'd looked everywhere for it and was getting run around in the codes, in the regulations, everywhere. Started asking some of my former coworkers about it, and one of them finally said, you know, I can't find it either. You just have to make a decision as to whether you're going to stay in the system or get out. So I had some decisions to make. I continued to research and the piece of information that really got me to the point where I had to stand up and do something about it was really the fact that the Federal Reserve isn't federal. They're no more federal than Federal Express, and they're owned by you know, wealthy banking families and whoever. And my little mind said, okay, so all this money that I'm giving over to the IRS isn't going to fix the roads around here because that's what the gas tax takes care of and It's not going to pay the police and the firemen because other taxes, like our Avalorum taxes, take care of that. It's going 
towards some kids that won't ever have to work a day in their lives, wealthy banking family children. So I was upset about that. And there was a, a website for your book, Joe. I actually found that you had written a book, and I said, okay, well, this is a former Asian also. We probably speak the same language. And as you know, I uh, sent money out to you for two of your books. And I <laughs> got a call from you. <laughs> one, late one night, I got a call from you. And uh, we talked for a good long while, and then you introduced me to several other people that were diligently searching for this law that requires people to file an income tax return. That's how I got started. I've always been one that was not afraid. I mean, when you grow up in on the east side of Detroit, <laughs> you learn not to be afraid. And even when I got here to Atlanta, I had already gotten to the point where I was very, very um, curious and unafraid. So I started speaking. You know, sometimes you and I went out and we spoke. We were on radio. And I guess the government really got fed up with us and started prosecuting, and that's that's where all the trouble started. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of the time frame because I think uh, the IRS started investigating me criminally in about 2001, and then I was indicted in 2004. And uh, was your the search warrant at, at your house was that around 2004? Right. That was July 2004 when they came in here with their guns drawn and took 32 boxes that they actually never gave back. And then they actually oh. didn't indict me because they never did find a felony. They sent an information, which is for a misdemeanor, and they charged me with willful failure to file, and that was in 2007. And, yeah, just for the listeners uh, who may not uh, know, the uh, a grand jury has to bring forth an indictment for a felony, but... The, um, the prosecutor, the federal prosecutor, and I believe this can happen with state prosecutors too, they can bring forward what's called an information, which is basically like a complaint uh, if there's a misdemeanor charge and a willful failure to file a federal tax return, that particular charge is a misdemeanor. So basically after all that they put Sherry through, which we're going to talk more about, um, all they could come up with was, you know, the prosecutor on his own, under his own volition, uh, putting forth this complaint uh, of a willful failure to file allegation against Sherry. So, um, well, maybe what we'll do, Sherry, uh, just uh, we got about a minute, so go ahead and give your websites out, and then uh, we'll we'll go to the break. Well, my blog site is SherryPeelJackson.org, and I just launched a couple of ministries. One of them is going to be social political. We're going to talk about these issues and talk about how we can, instead of just surviving, we can thrive. And that is wakethepeople.com. I have a women's ministry also, and that is Titus 2 International Ministries. That website is titus2345.org. They're all .org, I'm sorry. They're all .org. Well, that's fine. Well, that, you know, for people that are paying attention, uh, not, not everything is .com. But, uh, okay, well, then uh, everyone caught those websites. Of course, SherryPeelJackson.org. Uh, you could say the flagship website to find out more about Sherry. Uh, there'll be links to those other websites, but we're going to repeat them throughout the show. So our guest is Sherry Peel Jackson, and she's got an amazing story of how she stood up to the IRS, and she's still standing. So we're, we're extremely happy for her, and I ask everybody to keep her in your prayers. We will be right back with the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. My name is Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. Our guest is Sherry Peel Jackson. Uh, we've been waiting a long time to be able to have Sherry on the show, and so we're so happy to do so. Uh, she's going to be with us for the entire two hours of the show, thankfully. Uh, before the break, we were talking a little bit about um, the well, some of the interaction that she and I both had with the IRS, and we were kind of joking uh, during the break about how 
you know, we talk about indictments and trials and all these things, like it's just, you know, a trip down the road for a coffee. And uh, it's, it's quite a, it's quite an ordeal. Uh, We don't mean to minimize it, but once you've been through it, I guess you just kind of, you know, it just becomes a part of your life. But uh, as I said, I was indicted in November, 2004 on four felony counts, which you can go to my website. You know, this show isn't about me. Uh, but Sherry had a search warrant executed on her house in July of 2004. And then there was a trial that occurred quite a while after that. So I'm just going to give the floor to Sherry and uh, let her tell you about it. Well, after I got the information stating that they wanted to take me to court, this was maybe about April or May of 2007. And it went really quickly because the trial was set for October late October of 2007, and, uh, you know, I I thought I was prepared, but you really never know how devious um, these people are because they were out to get me. So you won your case, and three months before my trial, Tommy Cryer won his trial, so they just couldn't bear to lose another trial. Uh, One of the things that I noticed is that the jury... Juries are made up of people, and people are not educated concerning these issues. Another thing about people, they are afraid. One of the questions that I wanted asked of the jury during the questioning of the jury pool was, would you be afraid to acquit Ms. Jackson for fear of reprisal from the IRS? And I believe that more than 90% of the people in the jury pool would have raised their hands because these people are afraid. And I'm thinking in their minds they were thinking that, um, well, if I say not guilty, then they're going to come after me. Now, fortunately, at your trial you had some thinking jurors. I was there. I stayed out there two weeks uh, in California, Sacramento, and uh, you had a jury that thought. And also you had more information that was, Given. See, when you play football, and I mean, you may not have played football, but I've been around football players. When they are getting ready to come up against an opponent, they look at the opponent on, on film. Well, they realize that they made a mistake, Joe, in letting your video be shown to the jury. Because right. that was very powerful. It really was powerful. And you were saying, I think you said nine times in your video, I'm not telling you what to do, but this is what I learned. And the jury saw that as being credible. Well, when it got to mine, they definitely did not let me show any of the videos that I put together showing that I had good faith in what I believed. And unfortunately, there was a conviction. This was a misdemeanor. However, in the sentencing, the judge decided that she was going to make the charges concurrent. They they said that I didn't file tax returns for 2000, 2001, 2002, and 2003. That's four years. Well, although a misdemeanor in its definition in Black Law Dictionary is one year or less, she stacked those sentences on top of each other, and I was sentenced to four years. I had a um, person that did a sentencing guideline, and based on the sentencing guidelines, I was supposed to have 27 to 33 months, but the prosecutor actually asked for and, and was granted an upward departure of 15 more months. So I was sentenced to 48 months in federal prison. Uh, uh, phenomenal. And like you said, I mean, there's just, they've got such a big bag of dirty tricks. And then if they, you know, get, and, you know, it, it is difficult with the jury pools that are out there uh, showing them in just a span of a short trial what the truth is. And when you have the government obfuscating at every opportunity and judges, uh, you know, helping them along, uh, it's it's really an uphill battle. And then when you have liars, you know, some of the witnesses that were against me were the same former co-workers that I had gone to in my research and asked them, hey, help me find this law. Help me find this law that requires people to file an income tax return and pay an income tax. And I don't know what they were told behind the scenes, but they all got up there and denied that I ever came to them and asked them the question. One of the people in particular had given me some research. She gave me a research disc, and and this disc had a label on it. It had been mailed to her, and it was her name and her personal address 
on there. Um, so when she was questioned about that, she almost jumped up out of her seat. But it came to naught because the judge said, oh, well, you didn't bring that up in the beginning, so I'm not going to allow it. Um, the, the bottom line is the system is corrupt. People like me that are out there telling the truth, especially since they can't call us kooks like they used to, uh, several people with degrees, several letters behind their name are coming forth and proclaiming that the system is broken and the income tax is mis misapplied to American people. So they can't call us kooks anymore, so they just try to um, discredit us by putting us in prison. And, you know, thank God that they didn't get you, but they've gotten so many of us. And You know what? It's not working. I got so many letters, and we'll talk about prison later, but people are waking up. People are waking up. So even though I, I went to prison, I think that my plight woke up a whole lot of people that may not have uh, looked at this issue before. Well, and I, I totally agree with that. And I think, you know, every Christian ought to remember that the founder of Christianity is Jesus Christ, and he went to prison, and as did the apostles and you know, St. Paul, and uh, writing much of what they wrote that ended up becoming, uh, you know, the Bible from prison in, in many cases. So, um, it, you know, it, it right. just have gone to prison, and I think that's what you're saying, Sherry, is that, you know, people are waking up so much so that the kook label doesn't work, and even the jail uh, label or the, you know, jail having uh, occurred, prison, uh, doesn't isn't working either, and uh, it shouldn't because you know you believed every bit as much as I did. It's just that for whatever reason, you know, with that videotape that I that was gotten in, you know, the government in my case had very little to go on, and so they kind of seized this videotape as like their their prayer, you know, that it would work, and it totally backfired on them because it's basically two hours of me being sincere, being, you know, just telling people the way I really believe. Uh, and, right. and yet you have the same kind of footage, but because the jury didn't see it, they can't really see that you are sincere. Of course, the government will do everything to prevent that. Right. Unfortunately, um, that's the way it works. I mean, God has a plan for everything. If he didn't want me to go to prison, I would not have gone. And I do know uh, a lot of the reason why he wanted me to go. We can talk about that later, but the, the, the whole system, the, the trials, people really don't have a chance. I mean, it's a miracle for you to get through because there's so many lies that are told and, you know, to manipulate the questions, to manipulate people. And uh, the fear, I think the, the fear is the biggest thing, Joe. I think the fear is the biggest thing. And when you get at least one person that's not fearful, then you have a chance. But these people are so you know, bent on making sure that they don't rock the boat and they don't mess up their lives. They let fear rule them. And America doesn't have a backbone anymore, unfortunately. It is, it is sad. I mean, the, the tide is turning, but we, uh, I think we're kind of out there as the, the pioneers, the trailblazers up at the front. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people way back in the line that are saying, well, okay, you guys just go forward and we'll be right. We won't be right behind you, but we'll be behind you. <laughs> and I think that's uh, even better than the ones that just run in the opposite direction. Uh, I actually literally go. had someone run in the opposite direction when we were mentioning the income tax. So, um, Education is, is, is the key to getting people to understand that you, you are a slave. It doesn't matter whether you're black, white, green, purple, blue. It does not matter. You're a slave if you don't have control of your body. I don't have control of my body because I use my body. If I'm using my body to, to create resources to take care of myself and my family and someone else is taking those resources, then I'm not in control of myself. And oh. they're not the ones that are in control of me. God is supposed to be in control of me. So I am a slave as long as I acquiesce to this system. Do you find that um, African Americans, uh, like, get it much easier because of all the, you know, the history of of what black Americans have experienced? Um, do you find that it resonates more uh, in the African American community or... Seems to me it does, but I'd like like to know what you think. 
I don't think it's any different. I think that the ones that finally do get it, get it, and they see that portion of it, but there's so many in there that don't want to know what's going on, so many people that want to be taken care of by the government, so many people that do not aspire to go forth in developing their mind, and that's, that's one of the tragedies that I see, you know, not just in the African-American community, but people have just become complacent. And this is part of the reason why we're getting raked over the coals by all of these different organizations, government or otherwise, that are, you know, just telling people what to do and leading the sheep into the corral. And those of us like you and me are saying, hey, let's get away from the corral. And they're content because there's grass everywhere. And that's just so sad. Yeah, and the the efforts that were made basically, you know, at the time that you and I were born in the you know early '60s and and you know, late '60s and, and for decades, I mean, hundreds of years, literally, uh, trying to wake people up uh, about slavery and uh, you know, like you're talking about owning someone else's labor, owning someone else's uh, what they produce, their fruits, um, right. and it, it's too bad that. You know, people of any color don't see that. Uh, and I think, you know, again, people are waking up and it is encouraging, but it is uh, sad that uh, it's slow. But, you know, it's it's God's will, and sooner or later maybe there will be a big tidal wave. But in the meantime, we just have to be patient and keep telling the truth, right? Right. We look forward to that tidal wave. And, you know, <laughs> I, I look back at what I have learned about the civil rights movement and, and the people had enough. And when the when the country gets to the point where it has enough, then maybe we'll have some change. After the stock market crash in 2008, I looked at CNN in prison when the stock market went down 777.68 points in one day. I think that was an eye-opener for a lot of people because that took the stake off of a lot of tables. I think a lot of people lost at least 50% of their wealth. So they started asking questions, which is a good start because I've heard, I've gotten letters from people that says, you know, after the stock market crash and I lost half of my, you know, retirement and I was questioning what happened. And then I ran across all these other issues, the, the income tax, the Federal Reserve, all these other things, these wars. And that's what I want to concentrate on with Wake the People International Ministries. We have to talk about this and we have to find solutions because, we don't need to sit where we are and, and continue to be slaves to any kind of an institution. Couldn't agree more, and you're such a great spokesperson for, the, for those causes. Uh, got a little bit less than a minute. Maybe just, again, uh, say, say your websites or tell the listeners your websites, and then we'll go to a break. Well, my blog site is sherrypeeljackson.org, and I just started Wake the People International Ministry to talk about these issues, wakethepeople.org. I have a women's ministry because women need to figure out where their place is and get to the point where we are raising a generation of children that are going to be different, and that's Titus2345.org. Very good. Well, this is the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. We appreciate you joining us and hope you're enjoying the show. And we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom of Above Fortune radio show. Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomofabovefortune.com. We have as our guest today, Sherry Peel Jackson. She has an amazing story about how she spoke up. She uh, learned about the, the truth about the application and enforcement of the income tax, saw that there was a problem. Uh, she actually recognized this problem when she was a practicing certified public accountant after she had left the IRS. And uh, as she mentioned earlier in the show, she was an award-winning agent. She worked in the what they used to call the fraud group, probably still do. Uh, those are the civil agents that assist in criminal investigations. And uh, she even uh, participated in a, in a sting operation where she had to wear a wire, uh, which is probably pretty unusual uh, that they would, you know, that the civil agent would go into that kind of a dangerous uh, situation. So uh, she really 
you know, a hard charging uh, IRS employee, uh, worked hard, award winning, and then she starts to question about the uh, the income tax, uh, all these facts that show that there's uh, something rotten in Denmark, shall we say, and uh, was punished by not only a prosecution, but uh, a trial that you know with lying witnesses and uh, just, you know, a prosecution that pull out all kinds of dirty tricks and uh, was unfortunately um, convicted. And so, Sherry, just maybe tell, just tell the listeners what it's like um, to, to live, live through that, um, including, you know, what it's actually like to, what prison is like. Well, it, 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 was, I was, it was surreal when I was uh, convicted. Uh, I saw things just going in the wrong direction throughout the whole trial. But I felt so helpless because I couldn't do anything about it. I wanted to say things, and the judge was cutting me off. And the next thing you know, the jury comes back with guilty. And this is this is something that's interesting. The same judge that was uh, presiding over my trial was the judge that when I did get wired up before, when I was a civil agent, I had to be... A, a witness against the guy that I was uh, having the dealings with as an IRS agent, and this was the same judge. So I sat in that witness box several years prior as an IRS agent witnessing against uh, a construction uh, office, uh, a guy that had a construction company. And then this was the same judge. I don't know whether she remembered that or not. She probably did. But when she brought me into sentencing, the sentencing got put off you know, for various reasons, and she was angry that the sentencing got put off and told me that I just had to have the sentencing on Valentine's Day, actually. It was February 14th, 2008, and she demanded that I had to have the sentencing that day. Uh, the uh, prosecution had already put in for his upward departure to have my sentence be 48 months. I had some faithful people helping me out. Uh, bless his heart. One of them is my friend Lindsey Springer. He really, really helped me out a lot. Um, but in the event, uh, in the end, the judge said, and this is what she said, and I'm going to say it, Joe, just like she said it. I know you homeschool your children, Miss Jackson, and I know you got a lot of family support, but you can't run around the country telling people they don't have to file income taxes. That let me know right then that I wasn't conviction. I wasn't convicted for failure to file my own tax return. They got me for my free speech going around the country explaining to people what happened. So in essence, she turned the misdemeanor into what would have been a felony if they had gotten me on conspiracy to defraud the government because she said the, the trial wasn't supposed to be about what I was doing and what I was saying to others around the country. It was supposed to be about my own individual situation, but obviously it wasn't. So um, at that point, at the sentencing, I was not allowed to go home. Um, she posted some kind of weird bail that could be taken away at any time. So I was carted away right in front of my family on Valentine's Day of 2008. I was taken down into the basement of the federal building uh, in ankle bracelets, and I had shackles on my arms, so I could hardly walk. And I was put in a room that had two stainless steel benches, stainless steel toilet, and a stainless steel sink, and stayed there basically all day. Next, I was taken to the Atlanta City Detention Center, called ACDC. And the federal government had a contract back then with the city of Atlanta to house federal prisoners until they were taken to their destination. So I stayed there two months. The city of Atlanta somehow lost a contract with the federal government. And I was taken to a private prison. Uh, it was out in Lovejoy, Georgia. I think it was called the uh, Robert Dayton Detention Center. And it's owned by the GEO group. This is the same group that manages Guantanamo Bay. That was an interesting one month there. I tried to stay to myself a lot because I was 
obviously a lot different from the other prisoners. But then I was taken, flown on what they call Con Air. That's what they call the plane, uh, airplane that picked us up at the Atlanta airport. I was flown on Con Air to Oklahoma. There's a large prison holding facility in Oklahoma, so large that it has its own airport. So I was taken there just overnight. So I was flown from Atlanta to Oklahoma City, and the very next morning flown from Oklahoma City to Coleman Prison Camp, and that's about one hour north of Tampa, Florida. Prison life started at that point. Um, It was a big adjustment for me because I grew up very, very, um, let's say, conservative, quiet, logical, and prison is the opposite of all of that. This place was, it didn't have any bars, it didn't have any gates, it was like a college campus. You had, you know, dorms, four dorms, and they were all on top, I mean, they were, it was one building shaped like a V, and each side of the V had two floors. There was a cafeteria and, you know, some recreation, so it was almost like a college campus, but you couldn't leave. However, the women at the prison, as well as the women at the detention centers, had so much hurt and hate in them. And I started calling Coleman Prison Camp Romper Room Hell. I don't know how many people remember back in the 60s and the 50s Romper Room, but it was just very, very childish. And I went through culture shock. I also went through... Uh, physical sickness because I was, I I eat very healthy. I don't do fast food restaurants. I do lots of vegetables. I do uh, vitamins and minerals, colloidal minerals. And when I got there to the Atlanta Detention Center, I got really ill because my body went through total shock because the things that we were fed were just, to fill us up. There was not a lot of nutrition involved. I mean, it was just awful. And uh, after I kind of got my body back in some kind of order, then I went through culture shock because uh, the women in prison were, for the most part, they were very vicious. They were insecure. Uh, There weren't many physical fights because you would get shipped away, but there was a lot of fighting and bickering and gossiping, and that's just not, that's not my character. So I I started spending a lot of time alone. God blessed me with a job at the chapel. So I was the chapel clerk and um, tried to get a little bit more education about how prison life works from some of the girls that were Christian girls at the prison. Some of them had been there 17 years. Um, Drugs. Most of the women in the prison camp were there because they were running drugs, and the sentences that they got were sometimes harsher than the male counterpart that they were, their boyfriends or whatever. The boyfriend would rat out the woman, and he would get, 10 years, and she gets 20. So this, it's, the system is just really, really broken. So during my prison stay at Coleman Camp, I, try, I, made, I made a decision when I got there. My decision was to come out of there as good as or better than I went in. So there were some things that I did do and things that I didn't do. I didn't watch a lot of television at all. So I couldn't see uh, Net, uh, Nat Geo. National Geographic or maybe sometimes a sci-fi channel. I didn't want to watch television. I did not uh, watch romance movies. I did not uh, play games. They played cards a lot. They cheated a lot. They fought a lot. I didn't play games with people because I I was pretty good at Scrabble, and I played Scrabble with a couple of girls, and one of them just went ballistic when I beat her, and that was right after I got there, so I said I will not play Scrabble with anybody else. Um... I made the decision that I was going to start writing. And I started writing probably 
oh, maybe in 2009. I couldn't, I was still so frustrated with what had gone on that I couldn't write about it. But the chaplain advised me to start writing. And so I started writing in, in mid-2009 and got maybe about 80% through one of the books and started writing the second maybe a long summer of 2009. So I ended up with seven books uh, that I'm going to, I've got actually four of them are being published right now, and the other three I'll get to them at some other point. But that's how I spent my time, uh, praying, writing, trying to help those that wanted help. There were some that came to me and asked for help in different areas, even though they knew I wasn't a lawyer, they asked me a whole bunch of law questions for some odd reason. I tried to be nice to those who came around and, you know, tried to uplift the Christian standard there, which I'm praying that I did pretty good at. But it was just hard. It's hard being away from your family. You know, um, my children, when my son was just getting graduating high school. I, I always dreamed about being able to go and help him set up his dorm room. I didn't get a chance to do that. My daughter graduated in 2010. I didn't get to see her graduation either, so I missed both high school graduations. But bless God, I'll be able to see their college graduations. Um, being away from my husband, my my parents, you know, I'm an only child, so it was really hard on both my parents and, you know, my other family members. So that was the hard part. They did get a chance to come down to see me it was about a six-hour trip, and what my mother tried to do was coordinate it to where I would get at least a visit every month so they would take turns coming to visit me. And that's kind of yeah. how I got through. Well, God bless you. I mean, it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, it didn't, doesn't surprise me that, you know, you would, you would be very uh, productive with, with your time because, you know, we, we Christians, well, everyone, but the Christians recognize how they're accountable for their time and, uh, you know, want to bear fruit with their time. So, uh, could not surprised at all, and glad that you were very productive with that. Well, we, again, we have about a minute uh, until the break, so uh, why don't you go ahead and give your websites out, and um, then we'll take a break and come back and talk some more. Okay. Well, my my blog site, my main site is Sherry Peel P E E L Sherry Peel Jackson dot org. I also have Wake the People dot org and Titus2345.org. Those are the Fantastic. websites, Dan. And then maybe we'll come back. We'll talk a little bit about your books and uh, you know where you see the country going and things like that. This is the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. And uh, by the way, it's the Liberty Works Radio Network that brings you the Freedom of Love Fortune radio show, so be sure to support them as well. That's lwrn.net. And we'll be right back with our guest, Sherry Peel Jackson, after these messages. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom of Love Fortune radio show. My name is Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. We are happy to have as our guest on the show today, Sherry Peel Jackson. Uh, she will mention her website throughout the show, but you can go to Sherry Peel, that's P-E-E-L, SherryPeelJackson.org. And uh, for the break, we were talking about what it was like to spend uh, a few years in a federal prison camp. And as Sherry mentioned, they would transport her around, uh, I guess, more during the early part of the sentence. Um, she got an assignment as the clerk for the chapel at the prison camp. And uh, so basically we'll just have her uh, launch right back in if there's any other experiences there in prison that she'd like to tell the listeners about. And then maybe we can talk about the books that she wrote while she was in prison. Well, yeah, I uh, got very, very disgruntled. I mean, it, it, it was something that crept up on me, but over time I was just so frustrated with the whole situation, with being there, with being away from my family, and I started to get ill. I really didn't know that I was ill um, for maybe about three weeks, and then I started having uh, heart palpitations. My heart was racing, 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 and it kept doing that, and I kept going over to the medical department, 
and they kept telling me that they were going to put me on the schedule to be seen, and they didn't. And then when you when you would go over during the day without permission, you get chastised. So that happened a couple of times. But in June, late June of 2009, in the middle of the night, I, my heart felt like it was going to jump out of my chest. So I got up. We were we were supposed to be in the dorm for good at 9:30. And it was midnight, so I actually got up, put on some flip-flops, and went to the officer station to tell them I was having a heart attack. What ended up happening is I was taken to the hospital and stayed in the hospital for a week, and I had been diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. And I'd never heard of that before, didn't know what was going on, but the hospital actually treated me like a, a real person, not a prisoner, and uh, they sent me back to the camp with instructions and medication. The instructions were to monitor the medication because with with different people, the medication is different. So they started me off with a, a specific dosage, and it needed to be monitored to see if I needed more or less. Well, that didn't get done. So I started getting sicker, and November I really, really got sick. I got sick, started getting sick a little bit before November, but it my uh, neck swelled up like a puffer fish, and my lips turned black, and I was afraid. I went to the chapel, and she tried to help me. She got medical to come over on a Sunday, but they didn't do anything. So finally, uh, I called home crying because I couldn't really talk because my neck was swollen so bad. My husband got in touch with my uh, local congressman here, and... And I wrote a letter for him. I sent the letter via email to my husband, pleading to the congressman to do something because I was very, very ill. And my husband also sent that letter out to my fellow patriots out there. And that letter spread. And I know some of you may have seen that letter. Oh, my goodness. I was just pleading for help. <laughs> the next thing you know, the uh, American, Free Pest, American Free Press paper had me on the front page, and it had the caption, will the, fail, will the feds kill Sherry Jackson? Well, the night that that paper came to the camp, I was shipped away. They put me in a county jail for a day, and then two people in plain clothes drove me from Coleman Camp in middle Florida to north Florida in Tallahassee to the Tallahassee Federal Prison um uh, a federal correctional institution. This is a real prison where they keep the murderers, and it does have bars and gates and chains and fences and everything. So I was shipped there and put into their special housing unit. It's called the SHU. And that's where the people that get in fights while they're in this prison are kept. So I was within a prison, a prison within a prison. And... I had to stay there five months. I kept asking them why they put me there. I knew that I had not done anything wrong. I didn't contact the media. I had no idea of, about what was going on, about the letters that, you know, you patriots were writing to the camp, to the congressman. Someone had gotten Ron Paul involved, and his people sent paperwork down there to do an investigation. Actually, the day that I went into the medical unit to sign the paperwork, to give Ron Paul's team permission to do an investigation was the same day that I was shipped off. Um, that's why I was shipped they, they, um, at the FCI. The officers would not let me use the phone. I could not have any outside contact for about a month. Then they started letting me call home, but when I called home, I could only talk to my family 15 minutes, and the calls had to be monitored. And I didn't understand. I mean, I'm just a little five feet, five foot tall woman, but they were treating it like I was some kind of a terrorist or something like that. So I stayed there five months in a cell by myself. I didn't have normal shoes. I didn't even have sandals. They were these things that had rubber bottoms and, and colorful furry tops. So I stayed in there and I paced back and forth. Uh, for exercise because it was cold when I was shipped. I was shipped in December, and it was cold all the way up until March or so. So I paced back and forth. So they sent one of the guards to see if I was going crazy. 
And I told him, no, I'm just doing exercise. I, I can't go outside. It's too cold. Uh, I had a lot of time to reflect and meditate while I was there. And I actually wrote a prayer book while I was there in the solitary confinement. But I found out later on that the FBI was involved in this case because they claimed that some of the patriots and some militia was threatening the warden's life because of the way that I had been treated. So that's why I was shipped away. So I was thinking, well, if his life was threatened, why didn't they ship him somewhere? Why did they ship me? But (laughs) again, that's a retaliation for you. So that's what happened. I finally got away from there. I had to go back to that GEO private prison for a little bit, and then they sent me back to Coleman Camp. So they sent me back with these staff members that I had, you know, written in that letter how they were, you know, not taking care of me. So I really stayed in the dorm. I got a job as an orderly in the dorm, and I didn't come out much at all. When I did come out for long periods of time, it was after the staff had gone home because I did not want further retaliation. So this this whole situation with uh, the, the way that I was treated while I was there after I got sick was retaliation because you all stepped up and one you you told them we have we have our eyes on you and you're not going to treat her like that. Well, unfortunately, others that didn't have the support that I have have died in there. As a matter of fact, uh, just this past June, a couple of months ago, I got word that one of the women that used to help me passed away after trying to get the medical unit to pay attention to her. She passed away. She was she was older, but she wasn't that, you know, she wasn't really, really deathly ill. She just hadn't been taken care of. So, um, you know, Miss Mary, I'm going to miss Miss Mary. Miss Mary used to hide me. One of the things that I forgot to mention is that at this prison camp, Coleman Prison Complex has five prisons. They have two maximum security men's prisons, a minimum security men's prison, a low security men's prison, and the women's camp. The women are made to work at the men's prisons. And for a while, they would volunteer to go because the men had better food than the women. So women would run over there and work so that they can get the food. However, later on, they started forcing us to go, and I never wanted to go. A misdemeanor, per the definition in Black's Law, dictionary is not even supposed to be housed with felons. However, they sent me over to the men's prison to work in the kitchen. And Miss Mary used to hide me because I used to hide behind the carts because I didn't want to be there. So she passed away because of the lack of proper care. And if you want to see socialized medicine, go look at the prisons. That's that's astounding. So the the poor lady that was uh, was helping you out, she uh, she died there. She died right there in the prison, and she wasn't actually the first one. There was a woman that died when I was there. And this woman had uh, multiple medical problems, and from what I understand, one night they took her about three o'clock in the morning over to the medical unit. Nobody was there. The guards told her that she had to go back until six a.m. in the morning. That's when anybody that was ill had to go over to get, uh, try to get treatment. So they took her back over there at 6, but the medical staff wasn't there because there had been an emergency at one of the men's prisons overnight. By the time the medical staff got there, it was too late and Rita died. So it's something, even though I grew up in Detroit and grew up fearless, I did develop a fear of getting sick in prison. Uh, When I did get sick, fortunately, um, your eyes were on me so that they immediately got me care. As a matter of fact, when I was shipped to the Tallahassee FCI, the doctors over there made sure that the medicine was monitored and I was able to get the test test that I needed to make sure that um, my problems were uh, taken care of. So, 
what what what's I mean now that you've been through that where you know you you reach out for some exposure because you know generally that's how you can stay safe or at least the uh, the bullies you know aren't beating you up in the corner because the light's being shown on them uh but if you had to do it over again would you have tried to just endure it and because it got out of not got out of hand but basically all the people that were trying to help you um it ended up causing you to have a lot more uh, uh, nasty time being tra- uh, bussed around and going to other facilities. Uh, it was worth it because I don't know that I have, would have gotten, I would have been laying there dead with a heart attack. My heart would have probably just given out if I had not screamed. I was afraid. I was really afraid. Uh, I'm not even going to mention the other things that were going on with my body over the air. So it wasn't just the black lips. It wasn't just the heart rate. But I was scared for my life, and I, I know that being shipped around and, you know, all of the things that happened, it was definitely worth it, uh, me being alive and making sure that that I got taken care of. And, I, and I'm, I'm thankful for the people that wrote the letters to the Congress. They wrote the letters to the BOP medical department, the head of the medical of BOP, they, Ron Paul, uh, they wrote letters to Ron Paul. They wrote letters to other congressmen. As a matter of fact, my husband told me that our congressman, um, Hank Johnson's phone, was shut down for three days. They couldn't get another call in because there were so many calls coming in from the supporters that I had. So, yeah, I'd do it over again for sure because your life, there are people there. I, I've always been around people that cared about me. I've always had a loving family. Uh, even my extended family, my friends. And I was thrust into an environment where people didn't care about me. They cared nothing about me. They didn't want to know about me. They didn't want to know me, and they didn't want to help me. So I had to I had to cry out to those that cared, and they came through for me. So I definitely got the help that I needed. Well, I'm a I'm, I'm, little, little part of that. I mean, I, when I got the word, uh, you know, I spread the word as much as I could, and uh, you know, I had a similar experience, although it was in a civil arena where they wanted to take me to that Coast Guard island in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Not in the middle, but it's in the water of San Francisco Bay in order to, you know, they like to get you in a corner in a dark room and, and beat up on you. So I, I uh, got a taste of it, but you certainly uh, endured, a, uh, you know, horrendous uh, horrendous events there. We have a break coming up. Um, I'll just say that that, uh, the main website for you is Sherry Peel Jackson, and Peel is P-E-E-L-E-E, SherryPeelJackson.org, O-R-G. And this is the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. Joe Bannister, your host, AgentForTruth.com and FreedomAboveFortune.com. We're so happy to have Sherry with us, and we'll be right back after these messages. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom of Love Fortune radio show. This is Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. We are so happy to have with us today Sherry Peel Jackson, uh, talking about all of her experiences from beginning to work for the IRS, leaving the IRS, uh, discovering all of this information about uh, the truth about the income tax that the federal government and the mainstream media wants to keep from people's ears. And uh, one of their strategies is to discredit and silence uh, people, especially credible people. And who could be more credible than someone that used to work for the IRS? So uh, Sherry and I uh, share quite a kinship uh, in that sense that we, having both worked there, both spoken up, and both been punished, uh, but Sherry certainly... um, much, much more than me. Uh, it's we, we we're, we're brother and sister <laughs> in many ways. All right. But uh, we are happy to have her, and uh, we like to, I like to talk a little bit about your book, Sherry. Um, you said that you wrote quite a few of them um, while you were incarcerated, and uh, I I think they'd be very I'm sure they'd be very inspirational. And so, uh, why don't you describe the the various books for the listeners? Well, the one that's just a. Uh a group of things that I just thought about, some poems I wrote. The book called Lessons from a Christian Prisoner 
I guess I wrote that from the time I started writing in 2009 until I left. So the different thoughts and poems that I made up during that period of time, I put together in a book called Lessons from a Christian Prisoner. Um, the other book that I wrote, when I, like I said, I went to Tallahassee FBI, and when I was there, I was it was about 34 days before they would let me have a radio, and I found three great Christian stations there. And I would listen to Dr. Charles Stanley and David Jeremiah and Dr. Anthony Evans and some other ministers every day, just about all day, because, you know, it was I was locked in the cell. And I wrote a book called Prayers of Deliverance for Prisoners. And it's not just for people that are locked up in a prison, but people have their own prisons. I've talked to women that are not in a physical prison, but because of what's going on in their lives, they're in prison. So I wrote this prayer book to help people um, to get out of depression. I was in depression for a little while and despair, uh, to get over anger, to forgive. There's a lot of unforgiveness in prison. Oh, that's the biggest thing. There's so much unforgiveness. So I wrote a book to uh, how to conquer these emotions and these feelings. The other book that I wrote, (laughs) I wrote part of that when I was in the detention center the last time after I got uh, shipped from the FCI, this book is a fiction, nonfiction. And how is that? Well, I didn't want to write an autobiography. My story is not all that exciting. But what I did was I took the exciting parts of my story and the exciting parts of some of the women that I met in prison and created a fiction book called Wrongly Convicted. Now, In my experience, about 30% of the women that I met were either wrongly convicted or the sentence that they received for whatever they did was just outrageous, far longer than the crime that they so-called committed. So wrongly convicted, the fictional woman in this book had to go to prison, she was wrongly convicted, and she went through a lot of things in prison. And these are a lot of the things that I went through. I think about 90% of the things were things that I went through, and the other 10% are things that other people went through that I thought were worthy to put in this book. So when people read wrongly convicted, they will basically be reading my story. The last book that I did actually was called Questions People Ask About Prison Life. When I got back from prison, some people were shy, but a lot of people asked me questions. They didn't ask really deep questions, but they asked questions, you know, how was it, and what did you eat, and did anybody try to uh, hit on you, (laughs) those kinds of things. They would ask that. So I, I decided after a while, my little cousin, I was driving along with her, and she started asking questions, and it popped into my head, why don't you put these in a book? Why don't you answer these questions? I don't know how many people have uh, someone that they know that's in prison, but a lot of people are curious about what goes on in prison. And since I've been to city jails, private detention centers, prison camps, and and a full prison, then I had a pretty good experience, a roundabout experience about what goes on in prison. So that particular book, Questions People Ask About Prison Life, it has a lot of things that happened to me in there because people are asking, how was this? For instance, um, what do you eat? They fed us a lot of potatoes and rice and things that will fill us up. Well, what did you have to do for nutrition? They, They sold some cheap vitamins at the commissary. The commissary is like the little store that you can use money that people sent and purchase food. And I was blessed because people sent money. I I don't know how many times uh, calls went out for help for me over the radio or wherever, and, and money started flowing into my account. And through that, that's another thank you for your listeners and everybody else that helped me. I was able to eat a lot better. I I was able to stay away from the potatoes and rice and corn, and I was able to get uh, white meat chicken from the commissary in packs and tuna and things like that so that I could stay healthy, and plenty of uh, vitamins. So 
those are some of the things that I answer in the book, questions people ask about prison life. I, I feel like um, my flagship book is wrongly convicted because it is, it's, it's my heart. It, I put passion into it because it's, it's really what happened to me. Now, those four books are in the process. I actually, Lessons from a Christian Prisoner is a little e-book because it's really short. It's only like 25 pages. But prayers of deliverance for prisoners, wrongfully convicted, and questions people ask about prison life are being published. They're at the publisher now. And I have them for pre-sale, which is, which is something that will help get them paid for. When they go to my, my blog site, sherrypeeljackson.org, they'll see Awake to Truth Bookstore. And if they click on that, they're able to purchase the books. I just heard from the publisher, and unfortunately they won't be done until... The 20th of October, I did not know how much it took to get a book book published, the back and forth, the editing and all that. And I was expecting to have the books by this coming Friday, but she said that's not happening. She kind of laughed at me. But October 20th is when they're supposed to be done and out. And um, and people can, people can order them now. People can, I would really prefer them to order them now so that I could get them uh, quicker, but They'll, um, they'll really touch your heart. Um, one of the editors, which was my cousin, she said, I laughed a lot, but I cried a lot in, in both books, in Wrongly Convicted and Questions People Ask, because she looked at me, she says, I, I, you know, I hate that you had to go through that. Um, nobody really knows what, what people go through when they're in prison. But for me, it was God's chance to sit me down and show me what he wanted me to do. I had not been around women like that before. Uh, Our women are lost. I am a woman. I'm an older woman now. And Titus II International Women's Ministry will be to teach the younger women. Us older women need to teach these girls. I don't know about out there where you are, Joe, but the, the women here, they don't know who they are. You see them walking down the streets half dressed. Um, nasty attitudes, nasty mouths, and that's not what God's image of women is supposed to be, but just anybody, any moral person is even saying the same thing. We've lost our way, and I will really enjoy being able to put time and energy into helping young women avoid some of the things that are happening right now and get on the track to what, so they can be good mothers and godly mothers and godly wives. So that's a, that's well, it for my books. The other three books I'm not going to talk about because I don't even I don't even know whether I'm going to do them. I have to get myself motivated to get those three books done and I think maybe next year they'll be done. So it would be I mean I I've been to your website and the, the where the books can be ordered and so it, it would be um if people can you know those who can be patient which hopefully is everybody uh, you, they can go ahead and make an order and basically just be be patient because delivery might not occur until like late October, early November. Right, unfortunately, and that was a shocker okay. to me. So I am I am for the people that buy the three book set. I'm going to give the little ebook lessons from a Christian prisoner. Um, I'll send that to them via email, and if they don't have email, then I can mail it. Some of the people that have ordered, they don't like transact transacting over the internet so they've actually mailed their order in because there's a an order form and uh they will all be getting their books actually I'm, I'm i'm mailing out four tomorrow of the ebook for those that have ordered through the mail the other ones out i've sent those out to them the ebook i sent it out via email um a couple of days ago so i'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what people think about the books i'm actually looking forward also to speaking i I um, my children are 22 and 20 now, and they're just about on their own. So um, I feel led to go out and speak, whether that be um, women's issues or social political issues. Well, I, uh, I I'm sure the public can't wait to have you have you travel around. I know you were uh, doing that, you know, when when we first met, and uh, trying to get the word out. And so, and I you're just a very inspirational speaker. Uh, I love sitting there listening to you myself, so I know I know everyone else will too. Um, let's see. We only have maybe a couple minutes before the break, but I'm curious. Um, 
when, like as far as writing the book in books in prison, how, how does that work? They give you a little, you know, dull pencil and a piece of paper or is it basically, and you, and once you've write, written down things, do you, where do you keep it? How, do they try to take it away from you, rip it up? How does that all work? Well, you can buy paper, but they actually do give away paper, um, and you can buy pens. As a chapel clerk, I had the privilege of being able to type. We had two typewriters in the chapel, and when we had free time, we had to go buy our own ribbon and correction tape. But I type about 70 words a minute, so I actually got a chance to type a couple of the books, uh, the ones that I haven't gotten out yet. I actually wrote by hand the wrongly, wrongfully convicted. I wrote that by hand. Prayers for Deliverance for Prisoners was written in the special housing unit in the shoe with a dull pencil and little scraps of paper. After I finished it, I sent it home. The other books that I wrote when I was at the prison camp, we had lockers. They were about four feet tall and maybe three feet wide, and I was able to keep all that in my locker. However, I made copies and sent them home just in case there was a raid and my things were taken. So everything that I wrote, Either I sent it home, uh, sent the original home, or I sent a copy of them home. But the typing, that was a blessing for me to be able to type. Interesting. And they didn't, uh, I mean, obviously they would—they could look at what you sent out, and, and thankfully no one, uh, you know, took it away or threw it away. Whatever you had prepared eventually made it to your family uh, outside the prison. Right. Yes, they made it there. So when I got home, my prayers for deliverance book was here waiting on me. And uh, my uh, actually, when I left the prison, I was able to pack up all of my things. And that's and I still had the rest of the books with me and walked out the door with those. So that was a blessing to be able to get those because when you're writing, you know, your thoughts, they have to be captured right then. You don't want to have to go back and remember. Now, what is that I wrote? Because they took my paper. Thank God that right. I was able to get them home. Right. Very, very fascinating. Well, um, our guest is Sherry Peel Jackson, and we've got uh, one more segment, thankfully, that we're going to talk to her, uh, kind of cap off this great two-hour show. This is the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. We really appreciate the fact that you joined us here, and we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Freedom Above Fortune radio show. Joe Bannister, your host, agentfortruth.com and freedomabovefortune.com. And again, uh, our show is uh, carried, brought to you by the Liberty Works Radio Network, LWRnet, I'm sorry, LWRN.net. That's probably how many people are listening to the show. Uh, We also broadcast in the uh, Tampa, Ocala area. Hope that everyone uh, there in that part of the country is uh, doing okay with the uh, very bad weather that's going on. I'm out here in the Nevada desert where we just have to worry about not getting a big sunburn. Our guest is Sherry Peel Jackson. Uh, SherryPeelJackson.org is uh, one of her websites. I'll have her give out her other ones during this segment. And uh, Peel is P W E L. Sherry, S H E R R Y. P E E L, and then Jackson, J A C K S O N dot org. Well, Sherry, um, I just uh, am so fascinated by your your courage, uh, and I know you're, you're probably just like me. It's like, stop, 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 because <laughs> we're just trying to do the right thing. We're just trying to live a Christian life and and follow, you know, what Jesus told us to do. It's really uh, simple. Um, I'm sure you'd agree that I, I learned, you know, God tells you to trust him, and so you trust him. And and you don't need to put all this extra baggage uh, there to, you know, turn you down another road. Uh, trust in God and uh, do the right thing. Um, you know, obey the commandments. Be, be good, you know, kind to others. Uh, obey the golden rule, and it's amazing how much peace can be generated from that. 
You're right, Joe. I don't think I could have slept at night knowing what I know, knowing what I learned, and not telling people about it and continuing on with the fraud. We do have a God, and he is the one that told me to tell the people, tell the people what's going on, expose what's going on. And although I lost that trial, I'm telling you, when I lost that trial, I was like, God, how could you let me lose? You're the one that told me to go out and tell the people. Well, he definitely had other reasons uh, for making me uh, go to prison. I learned of, a, of what's really going on in the world. I had no idea. I was actually in a, a Christian bubble, had no idea what was going on as far as what people think. I mean, I was around those of us that I call the choir. I was always preaching to the choir. But I had to learn. You know, there are other people out there that want to be taken care of. There are other people out there that don't care. But God took care of me. He really blessed me. It was a blessing to have so many people support me. I got letters all the time. Some of the girls even commented that I needed to get my own P.O. box because I had so many letters coming in. I was blessed to have resources. You know, people were sending in funds so that I could get food, uh, get clothing, you know, because we did have to buy some clothing uh, from the commissary. I was also blessed in that my son, when I left, as I said before, he, he was graduating high school. And when I was shipped to Coleman, the next week he graduated, and I was really devastated. But he had gotten a scholarship and an extra scholarship from Oprah Winfrey. So Oprah Winfrey put my son through college while I was in prison. Uh, I don't watch Oprah, never did, but those that watch Oprah, my son was on the last Oprah show. It was filmed in Chicago. They flew him and some of the other people from his college, Morehouse College, up to Chicago for her final show. And he was on stage. I believe he was holding a camera with a whole bunch of the other um, young men that received the Oprah Winfrey Scholarship. So I was blessed during that time. I was shown that, you know, there is hope for our freedom. Uh, As long as we follow Christ, he's going to take care of us. He took care of me. And he's continuing to take care of me. He's showing me that there's still work to be done. There are still things that people need to understand about, you know, being human, about being free. We have unalienable rights. It really grieves me when people talk about our inalienable rights. It's unalienable. We have God-given rights that can't be leaned, and we need to take advantage of the fact that we are able, we have minds, we can work to make ourselves better. It's not good enough to just survive. We need to start thriving. I'm a strong advocate for home-based businesses. People that don't have enough resources, use your mind to go out and start making a living for yourself by yourself. Stop depending on these corporations because you know who the corporatocracy is at this point. They're working against you. Go out and start home-based businesses. Start bartering with your friends and neighbors. Get together and start sustainable communities. These are the things that I'm really, really excited about doing for our future because this is what's needed right now. We need to, we we are self-sufficient people. We can be. You know, God has taught us. He will show you what you can do. Some people say, well, I don't have a, you know, I'm not an accountant. Well, that's okay. There's some skill that you have that is valuable and that is needed out there. So we need to start working together. Those of us that are like-minded, we need to start uh, supporting each other. I'll try to go and find, you know, some, if I need to buy something and Joe has something on his website, I'd rather get that than go down the street because that's helping Joe. We need to start doing these things because, and also the education. Our children are being indoctrinated into a system that we don't believe in. Uh, I was blessed in that my children never graced the halls of a public school. We had them in Christian school, and towards the end, uh, we had them in a homeschool network. Well, when they were in their homeschool network, they read the Federalist Papers. The uh, uh, They read Thomas Paine. They read The Wealth of Nations. These books were coming in my door, and I was so blessed to have uh, that little homeschool network because now my children, they think for themselves. They're not involved in the group think. Now, this is not 1984 for them. They understand what's going on and they can think for themselves. They'll be able to operate globally. They don't They don't have to be stuck here. And we need to start helping 
each other teach our children so that we can America is a great country um, no matter how you got here you have opportunity to improve yourself if you stop making the excuses and I know I'm preaching to the choir here but there's so many people out here so many women that I met in prison and they were just full of excuses um, you know what we don't have time for excuses anymore. We need to start working on thriving. I would love to thrive. I, I want to get out of survival mode. Right now I'm starting over. You know, I've, I've just got off probation, and I have to start my life over. But I'm not going to give up. I'm going to start over, and I'm going to make it better than it was before. So what do you think about that? <laughs> I think you're a great inspiration, and uh, I, I think, well, tell me this. You must have been you must have been inspiring to the other uh, inmates. I mean, you must have seen, you were able to, to get to some of them, or maybe if hadn't they been exposed to someone who had your courage, who had your, uh, you know, enthusiasm for life, uh, you, you must have had some good experiences there. I did. You know, some of the, a lot of the women were younger, especially when I was in the detention centers. They were younger and some of them were even crack babies. They were, their mothers had been on crack. And they actually looked to me uh, as a mother figure. When I got to the camp, there were a lot of women that came to me for, you know, spiritual advice, advice about their families and whatnot. So they kind of recognized that um, I was there to help them. I helped them as much as I could. And I try to be an inspiration, but I want people to go with me. I'm going on a journey. This journey is going to uh, be uplifting. It's going to help our families. It's going to make us thrive. It's going to make us self-sufficient. It's going to make us be the people that God wants us to be. And all I ask is people to go. You know, if you, if you want to get on the train, you know, come on. Uh, that's where we need to go. We need to. Uh, there, there's so much going on out there that's distracting us from our full potential. That's the television. The television is what I call um, the electronic income reducer and the electronic intellect reducer because that's what it's doing. I don't watch television. I actually went and got a box and an antenna so I could watch the Olympics because I'm a former track runner, and I just wanted to see the track. So I saw a little swimming, a little gymnastics, and a lot of track. But I have not turned on that television since the Olympics has been over, and I really don't plan to because – there's too much work to do. There's too much out there that we need to be doing. We need to make sure that our children are not distracted, but they need to, like my daughter, she's in uh, school trying to get into the nursing program. She wants to be a nurse practitioner. She'll be able to, she'll be able to practice anywhere in the world. My son, is his major is international studies with a minor in Chinese. He speaks fluent Chinese. He just got back from China. He was at Shanghai University for a quarter taking advanced Chinese courses. He'll be able to operate internationally because, you know, the Chinese are everywhere. So we need to be at a place where we don't have to depend on a government for our survival. We don't have to depend on a corporation for our survival, but we're dependent on our God for our survival. Well, that's that's what it's all about, you know, and, and we um thankfully the Lord has brought us through these trials and uh fine tuned, you know, our, our relationship with him. And uh, you know, people might listen to this and, you know, think, Oh, this is this sounds so, you know, like like Bible something, but really I'm you know, I'm just being honest and uh you know, Sherry is too that uh you know having a relationship with god um gives you a great deal of peace and you may try to you know people try to find peace in the bottle or driving fast or you know skiing off cliffs or uh, what's the thing those guys do where they jump off cliffs with a like a parachute you know or a squirrel suit <laughs> oh, people find all kinds of ways to find peace and, and contentment in their lives and uh uh, Sherry and I both agree that the one way, a certain way, is uh, to have a relationship with God, and it, it brings you a great deal of peace and a great deal of purpose. And 
I'm just, I've always been thrilled uh, that from that first day, Sherry talked about this earlier in the show, where she learned about my situation and called me, and I was just on cloud nine that uh, a CPA and a former IRS revenue agent was calling me, you know, interested in what I had to say. Because, of course, there'd be people that said, oh, you know, you're a crackpot. Uh, Nobody else would believe this stuff. And, you know, when you get credible people that respond, it's it's really, it's fantastic. So I've been uh, thrilled with Sherry Peel Jackson ever since she introduced herself to me. And uh, I'm just thrilled that uh, things are going well for you. Uh, we only have about a minute and a half left, so I just want to make sure that the listeners, you know, understand. Sherry's uh, been through a lot, and she could use your prayers certainly. But please go to her website, SherryPeelJackson.org, and Peel is P W E L, and Sherry is S H E R R Y. SherryPeelJackson.org, and uh, you can support her with little donations, uh, but also. You know, order these books. It might take a few months to get them. That's okay. You're going to get some great books in the meantime. And uh, Sherry, got a little less than a minute. Just give your websites out one more time, and then we'll we'll sign off. Well, wakethepeople.org is a ministry that I've started to talk about these social and political issues so that we can start to thrive instead of survive. And the women's ministry is Titus II International Women's Ministry, and that website is Titus 2, 3, 4, 5, because it's Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, tell the older women to teach the younger women. And that's what we're doing. I have a group of women that will be teaching on different areas, and we're going to show the, even the older women that need to know, but the younger women especially, how to be godly women, godly wives, and godly mothers. And then, of course, SherryPeelJackson.org. Right, that's well, every Sherry, month I blog on that, so they check that out every month. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for spending the entire two hours of the show with us, and we'll have you back again sometime. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much, Joe.